I'd like now to introduce our first speaker. Dr. Marsha McNutt is the 22nd president of the National Academy of Sciences uh, and is a geophysicist by training. She has served previously as editor-in-chief of Science Journals. Um, she was also the director of the U.S. Geological Survey uh, during a time in which USGS responded to a number of major disasters, uh, including the Deepwater Horizons oil spill. Uh, for her service then, uh, Dr. McNutt was awarded the U.S. Coast Guard's Meritorious Service Medal. She's a fellow of numerous societies and organizations, including the American Geophysical Union, the Geological Society of America, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and the International Association of Geodesy. She's also a member of the American Philosophical Society, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and a foreign member of the Royal Society in the United Kingdom and the Russian Academy of Sciences. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Marsha McNutt. Well, thank you very much, Jeff, for that introduction, and happy birthday, USRA. I'm really pleased to be able to uh, give some opening remarks today on this auspicious occasion. So uh, what I'd like to do today is uh, tell you a little bit about the coupled history of the Academy and USRA and uh, how together we have prospered over the years and promoted space science and research. So first of all, a little bit about the National Academy of Sciences. Um, I never like to underestimate how little people know about the National Academy of Sciences, not the least of whom are our own members. So uh, let me begin by saying that um, the National Academy of Sciences is actually 156 years old now, so uh, we actually predate USRA. And uh, we were founded uh, by Abraham Lincoln during the Civil War when uh, the president decided he, he, he was actually very brilliant, um, which goes without saying, but in any case, um, he decided after the Battle of the Monitor and the Merrimack, when they fought to a draw in the Battle of Hampton Roads, that having technology uh, would be the key to winning the battle space and he wanted to have the scientists on his side. So as Congress was going into recess at midnight, he got a bill through Congress to establish the National Academy of Sciences as advisors to the nation. And the National Academy would be non-governmental, it would be self-perpetuating, but the purpose of the National Academy would be to provide advice to the nation whenever the government asked for it. And so over the next 156 years, the mission has been to provide nonpartisan objective advice for decision makers on any pressing issue. And we do that by pulling together smart people like all of you here whenever your uh, wisdom, experience, and advice can be useful to solve thorny problems. Now, um, the National Academies um, founded the uh, Space Science Board in 1958, and that was at the request of the Executive Committee of the U.S. National Committee for the International Geophysical Year, the IGY. So the Academy actually got in on the space race at an early time, and the board's mission was to survey the scientific aspects of human exploration of space and to provide advice to NASA, to the DOD, and to NSF on multiple issues that have to do with um, the space race, on interplanetary probes, 
space stations, potential problems from manned spaceflight, exploration of the planets, and other space matters. Now, um, I have to give an apology right now because I'm gonna show a lot of pictures from the early days of the Academy and its interaction with space that are gonna show a lot of men in suits. And for all the women in the audience, I'm sorry, that's just the way it was, and it's not the way it is now, okay? So we've come a long way. Uh, another um, uh, just piece of history, as for those of you who do not know what's up there in the upper right-hand corner, <laughs> that is a postage stamp. And people used to actually pay to send mail. In, in the International Geophysical Year, it cost three cents. Now, of course, it's free on the internet, um, but you can actually still send it uh, the way they did uh, back in during the IGY, except instead of being three cents, it's now like 50 cents or something. But, but these stamps were also used to commemorate important things in American history, such as the IGY, and people actually collect these stamps, and they're probably worth a lot more than three cents now, uh, just to collectors. Now, um, one of the first entries of the U.S. into the um, uh, space race was in January uh, 31st of 1958, uh, when a U.S. Army Jupiter C rocket launched Explorer 1. And uh, here we have uh, the Explorer 1 uh, model being held by William Pickering, uh, James Van Allen and Werner Von Braun, uh, and they're here in this actual building at a late night uh, news conference announcing the launch. And it made sense that this was held at the National uh, Academy of Sciences um, because if you look at the timeline for this launch, there was an October meeting um, the, uh, in 1954 um, in Rome when the U.S. National Committee for the IGY that was working under the sponsorship of the NAS came up with the idea for it. So in 54, the idea for this satellite came up. In 55, Eisenhower announced that the U.S. was going to put um, this satellite into space. And by 58, it was in space. So that is an amazingly uh, short timeline, given that we had not um, launched something before. And of course, all of this w had been triggered by the launch of Sputnik 1. Um, so after uh, the launch of Explorer 1, um, the next thing that happened was in March, of March 17th of 1958, there was a three-stage launch vehicle that put Vanguard into uh, an elliptical orbit, and it was the first satellite to have solar electrical power, which was a great innovation at that time. Its mission was geodesy, to measure the shape of the Earth, and one of the uh, novel uh, observations that came out of Vanguard 1 was that the Earth was actually uh, not just elliptical, it was slightly pear-shaped, much like many people. Um, so with a, a slight north-south asymmetry. Um, Vanguard is actually still in space, and so it um, has actually set um, a record as being uh, one of the, in fact, it remains the oldest man-made object that is still in Earth orbit. And um, another picture of all men sitting around the table. Um, the, they are having a meeting with uh, John Hagen, who is director of Project Vanguard at the US Naval Research Lab. Okay, so uh, next. Um, 
I'm going to present um, some examples now of spectacular science uh, that's come out of the um, U.S. Uh, forays into both Earth observing and uh, space observing um, with um, much of the technology that's been developed and advice that's come out of the Na National Academies. So first, I'd like to start with my own favorite, which is Landsat, because as you heard, I was director of the USGS. So I came to be director of the USGS in 2009. So if you look at this timeline, in 2009, um, on this timeline, it was during um, a period when Landsat 5 was still operating. Landsat 5 was launched in March of 1984 with a three-year design life. So um, by that time, it had been operating many, many sigma beyond its uh, design life. Landsat 6 had been launched, but went, went immediately had a launch failure, so never returned any useful data. Landsat 7 had been launched in um, April of 1999, also with a three-year design life, uh, had uh, some uh, problems in its instrumentation, but uh, its calibration was dead on and uh, was still operating also many sigma beyond its design life. And so in 2009, given the many users worldwide that depended on Landsat data as uh, USGS director, one of my main uh, priorities was ensuring continuity of the Landsat record. So I worked with my colleagues at NASA to get Landsat 8 funded and launched in 2013, just as Landsat 5 failed. And we decommissioned Landsat 5 to ensure continuity of uh, the Landsat record with some overlap of Landsat 7 and Landsat 8 to make sure that Landsat 7 could be used to calibrate Landsat 8. And now I understand there is even talk at uh, NASA of refueling Landsat 7 in space because it's otherwise operating uh, with useful data coming back and the only thing that's limiting it is the benzene that's needed to do small orbital corrections. And so they're thinking of doing a, a refueling in space, which would be a first. So the Academies has also built a reputation for um, providing advice. Um, the main, uh, for um, all of our, for our space program, with the main vehicle being the decadal surveys that have come out of the Space Science Board. Um, these provide community-led assessments of the state of knowledge. They um, prioritize questions for the next decade, and they offer uh, recommendations for programmatic directions and priorities for investment in research and facilities. The 1990 decadal survey recommended a program in adaptive optics, which proved to be quite pivotal. Because ground-based telescopes were getting larger, and astronomers found themselves in a predicament because Earth's atmosphere was distorting incoming light from celestial objects, which made um, resolving them very difficult. And the use of adaptive optics promised um, the possibility of countering the distorting effects of the atmosphere. Um, adaptive, um, uh, adaptive optics uh, were already being used in the defense community um, from uh, use in missile defense uh, applications. So today, adaptive optics are integrated into uh, many large telescope observatories and uh, 
has allowed um, resolution of many objects in the heavens. But in addition, the spillover into other aspects of research has been truly monumental. Researchers can now image neuronal structures inside a live mouse's brain with five times better signal than without the adaptive optics. The technologies also used by doctors to view individual rods and cones within a person's retina. And that allows for more precise measurements of retina changes and diagnosis of eye disease. So here's um, really kind of um, a fun picture, unless you happen to be in the flooded area, that shows um, a normal picture of this area around uh, Des Moines, Iowa, um, and uh, the picture of what it looks like when it's flooded. And the light blue areas are ice on this river system, and the dark blue areas are open water. And you can see the impact of the ice damming up the river and causing the uh, flooding where, um, where the ice um, uh, uh, doesn't allow the, the water to drain downstream and actually in, in several areas of this river system has um, created these um, natural dams that um, caused uh, the flooding, the spring flooding. Um, so uh, these, um, these observations can really be helpful in understanding what areas are subject to hazards and why. Um, another area where Earth observing has been uh, exceptionally useful is uh, in understanding uh, global warming. Um, when global warming first entered the vernacular, there were lots of um, discussions about the causes of global warming. Um, geologists knew from the rock record that there were external forces um, caused by uh, small uh, orbital variations in insulation. And there also, through Earth history, had been internal uh, forcing of climate due to volcanic eruptions, changes in configuration of the tectonic plates, which change ocean circulation, uh, et cetera, um, and uh, changes in configuration of mountain ranges, et cetera. Uh, but the real question was, uh, what would be the human contribution to it? Well, the Academy was asked to investigate that. And in 1966, the Academy put out a report where the experts stated, we're now just beginning to realize that the atmosphere is not a dump of unlimited capacity in reference to CO2, but we do not yet know what the atmosphere's capacity is. And now we're beginning to see that. So here is a um, video, and let's see if it plays when I click one more. No, let's see. Uh, I'm not sure how to get this to, oh, there we go, thank you. All right, so this is a, a video that's going to show um, changes in um, the uh, minimum sea ice uh, before, um, it starts to uh, expand again in the winter. And the red line shows uh, the minimum over time. And what you can see is that this, uh, while there, it's a little bit of a sawtooth pattern, the rapid dropping off um, in uh, the last uh, two decades of um, the uh, surface ice in the Arctic. And that is uh, thanks to satellite observations. Um, there's also, in addition to the uh, decrease in the Arctic, um, the overall reduction in sea ice um, has been monitored for uh, several decades. Uh, in the Antarctic, there's been a slight increase in the amount of ice, which we also understand, because Antarctic, Antarctica is basically a desert. There's very little precipitation that happens in Antarctica. 
But as the ocean uh, around it warms, that increases the amount of precipitation. And as more precipitation falls, then uh, more, um, uh, more uh, snow and ice um, are created. But still, the overall net effect globally is a decrease in ice. So here are just um, some recent reports that have come out of the Space uh, Science Board. Um, they represent com community-led assessments of the state of knowledge in fields. They provide recommendations for explicit priorities for investments in research and facilities, including prioritization of missions. They provide a forum for addressing uh, advanced technologies, infrastructure. Um, they make recommendations for interagency coordination when it makes sense, also for education and for international cooperation, which is increasingly important in a time of limited budgets. Um, the, this whole area continues to have strong support for Congress, and uh, we work uh, well with Congress to make sure that it's all guided by the best science and guided by input from the scientific community as opposed to being guided by um, considerations that are not evidence-based. Now, I won't repeat what you've already uh, heard. Uh, this doesn't, I don't want this to be one of those meetings where everything's been said, but not everyone said it. Uh, as you know, USRA was created um, through support of the National Academy, NASA, and the research um, uh, universities in 1969. Um, the breadth of the research which is included in USRA is truly breathtaking because it includes not just astronomy and astrophysics, which everyone, you know, is kind of like obvious, but it's the behavior of materials and fluids in the space environment, computer science, earth science, human physiology in the space environment, immersive training for students in space and earth science, this topic is a magnet for students to get interested in science and engineering. And there can be nothing more important than thrilling and engaging the next generation in science and engineering. Um, lunar and planetary science, numerical and applied mathematics, and space-related technology development. So it is truly an expansive uh, number of, of fields. And I'll just end here with a reminder that there are still wonderful things out there to see. All right, thank you all very much. Oh, sure. Uh, are there questions in the audience for Dr. McNutt? Do we have any questions online? No questions? Oh, there's one. Brian. Just, uh, what are Look, wait, uh, can we ask you to use a microphone? Can someone bring Brian a microphone, please? Well, I could just possibly stand next to this one here. Okay. Yes. I was simply going to ask uh, what you view as uh, the next big challenges for the National Academy looking forward for its, its future as well. Uh, beyond just the Space Science Board, challenges for yeah, the I'm, Academy? I'm thinking more broadly, yes. Yeah. Okay, so um, I would say that, um, uh, you know, it's, it's timely that you asked that question because we just completed a retreat with some um, very sort of forward-thinking members of the Academy to put together a strategic plan. And I would say, um, what excited people most was getting the Academy more involved, not just in providing advice to the government and to major um, leaders and stakeholders, 
but the academy taking more of a role in reaching the public too on the importance of science. Science is a way of knowing about the world that they're in and the importance of science in just everyday decisions that, that citizens make about the products they use, the places they live, um, the, um, every, everything that they, uh, how they vote. Um, we believe that really the academy cannot shy away from the importance of um, helping society understand that science is fundamental to uh, the, the way we think about how we should live our lives and that science is one of the few um, human endeavors that has allowed more people to get ahead without some people getting behind. And if we don't use science responsibly, then um, we're, we're not actually taking full advantage of our investment in it. So thank you for that. Thank you so much.